<laughs> Welcome everyone to the Halo Collective Company Update Call. There's a designated investor that will be asking questions we've gathered and compiled over the past week. Before I get into that, I have a little bit of information to read. In addition to myself, your speakers on today's oh, call will be Jordan Stu, co-founder and CEO of Halo Collective, and Ted Burke, CEO of Aconda. Before we begin, I would like to remind listeners that certain statements made during this conference call presentation may constitute forward-looking information and forward-looking statements within the meaning of applicable securities laws. These statements involve known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors which may cause the actual results, performance, or achievements of Halo Collective and its subsidiary entities or the industry in which it operates to be materially, di materially different from any future results, performance, or achievements expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. When used in this conference call presentation, such statements use words such as may, will, expect, believe, plan, and other similar terminology, and include, among other statements, regarding expected operating results, future growth, anticipated capital expenditures, corporate strategy, and proposed acquisitions. These statements reflect management's current expectations regarding future events and operating performance and speak only as of the date hereof. Important factors that could cause HALO's actual results and financial conditions to differ materially from those indicated in the forward-looking statements include, among others, economic and financial conditions, the ongoing impact of COVID-19 strategic actions, including acquisitions and dispositions, and HALO's success in integrating acquired businesses. These risk factors are discussed in detail under the heading risk factors in HALO's annual information form dated March 31st, 2021, and HALO's additional disclosure documents filed on CDAR. New risk factors may arise from time to time, and it is not possible for management to predict all of those risk factors or the extent to which any factor or combination of factors may cause actual results, performance, or achievements to be materially different from those contained in forward-looking statements. Given these risks and uncertainties, investors should not place undue reliance on forward-looking statements as a prediction of actual results. Although the forward-looking statements contained in this presentation are based on what management believes to be reasonable assumptions, HALO cannot assure investors that actual results will be consistent with the forward-looking statements. The company undertakes no obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise, other than as required under securities legislation. And so without further ado, I will now introduce and turn the presentation, the question and answer session over to our investor, Sunny uh, Labanat. Hi, everyone. Um... I don't see video here. Is there any chance to? Well, you see, hopefully you see us. I see you. Oh, there we are. Excellent. Cool. Okay. Perfect. Hi. How are you? How's uh, how's everything going there? Um, it is. Uh, it's hectic, huh? <laughs> we just uh, we we just got into Louisa's apartment in uh, Johannesburg. We were in uh, Mafetang at the site about what four out three four hours ago I had to drive across the lesotho south african border get to blue fontaine and then hop a little puddle jumper here and then take the train from uh, the airport um, down to sandleton and get a key to louise's apartment and start looking at these questions for you guys <laughs> now we appreciate you uh taking the time out to address a collective of different communities from all over the internet uh, regarding, uh, you know, a unified list of questions. So we appreciate that. Uh, without further ado, I'll start with some of the questions here. Um, Kieran, how have the last three weeks in London been for you? And can you provide any updates regarding Canmark? Well, I'm going to speak with Tej um, on this, but we have, um, and, you know, just to step back, and I think we said this in the press releases, that if you look at Halo, there are really three... Um, 
distinctive businesses, right? So you have a recreational business based in the United States. You have these assets in Canada that operate recreationally, legally, um, you know, but that can go either way. And then you have a, you have a medical business in the rest of the world, <clears throat> in effect. Right. Um, and that in that medical business is a completely different business in the way you distribute and sell from the recreational business. Um, and uh, we underwent a, you know, an extensive search, executive search, and we came upon Tej. Ironically, I'd met him once before at uh, an event in London. We had breakfast once. And we were down to, uh, interestingly, two candidates. And um, I called Bruce Linton. And he called me back within a few minutes. I missed his call. And then I called him back. And he highly recommended Tej, given his both his investment banking background, his experience in building up uh, the canopy business, and then his experience at Chiron. So I went to London really to onboard Tej in part. Um, and also to learn, get schooled in the international business myself. And uh, now we're here in um, Africa and have spent um, the better part of a week just uh, working at Buffalo. Um, uh, spent a couple of nights in Louisa's uh, family compound out in the village. And, uh, you know, and uh, Taze, you can take it from here and just introduce yourself and tell everyone about Aconda and what the vision is and, you know. Yeah, where it's going. Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. Uh, well, firstly, uh, thank you for everyone for your time and, and gathering here. Uh, it's been it's been a, a great welcoming to come into uh, the Halo family as, as CEO of Aconda. Uh, there's been a huge outpouring of support from my network within the industry, uh, my network in capital markets, which includes both the banks and investors. And uh, uh, you know, when you make a big move like this, from being a regional head at a company to being CEO of a company, uh, it's a, it comes with a lot more responsibility. And uh, I'm, I'm more than ready for this and, and excited to take on, on what's going to be, I think, a very unique play in the international space. We're going to be building a scalable, ethically sourced medical cannabis play that will leverage all the strengths of Lesotho. Uh, integrated into our uh, current international infrastructure like Canmart and deliver what will be uh, excellent brands, the trusted brands that, that we have relationships with from our Halo heritage at a great price point. And in the market in Europe where you have uh, really a, a nascent market in places like the UK and, and a, a market that's just taking off in, in Germany, uh, you still have a, a lack of consistency, supply, quality, uh, variety, and, uh, and and so this is where we can really bridge the gap with all of our knowledge of strain selection, strain hunting, and deliver it to the patients in the international market. I'm no stranger to bringing new products into Europe. I've done it from scratch with, a, with my previous company in both the UK and Germany. I oversaw a 40 to 50 million euro top line business at Canopy Growth that spanned multiple countries across Europe. And, uh, and I think it, it's time to do it again, but this time with an asset which I think will be unbeatable in terms of its cost positioning and, and its ability to generate quality product. So that that's really the, the, the message I wanna send here. It's it's price and quality ratio that I think is, is really gonna be unmatched if we develop it the right way. Okay, great. I have a question actually uh, to, regarding Buffalo operations. Um, how much product and revenue do you expect to generate from Buffalo in 2021 and 2022? So 20, 2021 this year, I was just, we were literally there counting product that's vaulted, um, trimmed up, ready to go. Um, anywhere, let's say between two to five hundred thousand dollars i would say this year we're not going to pull we'll pull down the autos towards the end of this year so let's say two to five let's say two to five hundred thousand in that range this year um next year uh and you know we've we the we've sort of come up with a completely uh, how do i say this a little bit more aggressive way of going about it now having spent time with Tej. And part of what we have to do this year is, 
And what we've done is identified those strains that are between 20 to 25 percent that are award winning that we can grow in the soil consistently. Uh, and we have to put them in a three, depending if it's Australia, three to six months, what known as stability testing. So those are the strains that we're going to grow next year. So that was the big part of this year was identifying what we're going to grow next year. And so, for instance, Holy Grail by DNA is hitting around 25. You, you can't hit over 25, otherwise you have to go to oil. Um, you know, the Tangi is hitting around 20 in, in that range. So, so that's going to be really critical. So we've got our production strains down. Now the question is that, you know, within our fence, which is within our six hectares, how do we utilize it? So what we're doing is we're actually doing the exact same strategy that we're doing at bar x with the exception that under lasudu licenses we have to be under shade cloth so what we're doing is we're laying down most of that six hectares as we're doing at bar x with beds you know with soil um drip irrigation um in a shade cloth grow which is sort of the classic way of doing it we're installing the Cravo, so we're installing our first Cravo as well. And then we're taking our barn, that big barn you've seen, and we're converting it into the most massive drying, <laughs> GACP drying um, uh, machine that you'll see. So we're double stacking it actually, and um, to be able to take on all that product. And Tej said something funny where he almost had a heart attack when he realized how much product that would produce. So Andreas is planning on two cycles. He's planning on a, a flower, an auto flower cycle, and then what we call a, a boutique strain cycle now that we have our strains identified. But um, next year, um, the out, output, you know, Andreas's target, again, this is his target, is he wants 20 million grams of output. Tej had a heart attack when he heard that and said, oh, my God, that's that's almost as much as Germany took down this year. That's right. Right. And that's just on six hectares. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we have a longer term vision where we want to do 20 acres of greenhouse. Yes. 20 acres of Dutch greenhouse. We really recently brought on one of Tej's colleagues from Canopy, Anthony Lacombe, um, to who's like a greenhouse. Um, he's actually Dutch. Um, uh, living in Ottawa, but he's a greenhouse expert. And so part of the vision, I think, over the next couple of years is going to be, you know, getting the solar power, getting a dam, working with the government, working in the, in the special ec economic zone there. The other thing I've learned from Tej, a couple of things I've learned from him is in, a, in the States, um, we, we sort of separate flour into A, Bs, and Cs. Um, in Europe, A's, A's, B's, and C's all sell at A rates. So you have a mixed bag and your shake, or what they call granulated product, is your trip. There's a lot of room in Europe, and what's, what's really key about Tej and what value he adds is he's going to build out that network, right? And so this year, um, our strains are nailed. Say we get somewhere between, say, two to 500,000, two on the low end, 500,000 on the high end. But next year, we haven't put the projections together. Um, but next year is going to be a big year for us. And remember, our first crop, remember, everything's opposite. So our first auto flower crop will come down in January. So as long as we have the stability testing nailed, everything done, um, then we can immediately start to move that product. Yeah, look, I, I think that that's um, a fair assessment. Uh, yeah, the, the, for me, this trip was about learning the setup, understanding the, the quality, and seeing how we're conforming with a pharmaceutical standard market. I mean, that that's really the key here. We're bridging the gap with recreational West Coast know-how, which is incredibly versatile and produces very high quality buds. I've, I've seen it myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can compare that to anything that I've seen in, in the European markets and say that that stands out in terms of quality, but we do have to marry it with those pharmaceutical regulations. So that includes things like stability data and then also registering the product. So that, that timing can be variable. So we're, we're mapping that out to determine how that turns into sales. And then at the same time, 
we're going to be figuring out uh, exactly how we phase in the sales. So ahead of actually having products registered for sale in uh, the German market as a pharmaceutical, for example, we'll probably be looking at this B2B business first. So uh, selling their flour for extraction and other B2B purposes. And then we'll, we'll get to that sort of end market where we'll probably do a mix of entering the, the wholesale market and, and or finding uh, sales and marketing partners. I mean, really, we want to drive returns. That's the focus mm -hmm. here. This is about looking at returns and, and making profitable long-term business arrangements. And I mean, given our, our positioning, I think we have the, the ability to do that. I was able to do that at a much higher cost base in other markets. Okay, well, um, what are your expectations and achievable margin from products being exported by Buffalo? Um, that's, uh, so I'll tell you where the market's at right now. Um, if we were not to, if we were to move product B to B in in um, Lesotho, what we're hearing is for our flour. Um, remember that's A's, B's, and C's combined. It's about two dollars a gram. Let's say a buck fifty to be conservative to two dollars a gram. If we're looking at the granulated, they were saying about two hundred to three hundred a kilo, right? So um, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, the pricing on the A's, B's, and C's are right in line with what we see uh, in North America for high quality greenhouse almost. Um, but remember, B's, you, it drops in, in, in the Americas. Let's say you sell your A's for a thousand, just an example. Your B's you'd sell for maybe 400 here. Your A, B's, and your C's, you maybe sell for a little bit less, or your smalls, as we call them. And then in terms of fully loaded costs, we're still sort of playing around with it, depending on how you load it. Um, but it's probably around, to produce all of it, is probably around 50 to, let's say, to be the most conservative, 70 cents a gram. Okay. Right. Excellent. Um, I mean that. I mean that's just being very conservative. And and to just kind of connect that to where wholesale prices are, and in, in say the German market, we're talking anywhere from between three to four fifty euro a gram. So now obviously we're going to have to work out uh, some of the, the, the freight costs and interchange costs and potential tolling, but uh, there, there's plenty of margin to play with in that. Yeah, and and when I when I'm talking those numbers, I'm talking landed cost um, in Europe. So, you know, like Tage and a lot of these Colombian players and other players have thrown around numbers of 20 cents a gram. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you could say that it's 20 cents a gram, but by the time you test it, by the time you prep it, by the time you irradiate it, by the time you get it to Europe, you know, yeah. it's, gonna be, it's gonna be 50 to 75 cents. So that, you, you know, that okay. 20 cent number, right? And yeah, our trimming cost is $10 a pound for really high, good, High, I mean, high finished trim product here, which I would yep. love to have back in California or Oregon, <laughs> where it's more like 120. You know, uh, so I'll quickly touch. Uh, I just want to, I want to quickly ask about um, GACP and what's left uh, to do, and then we'll circle actually to uh, back to America and talk about California and Oregon sales. But uh, what's left in G GACP? Um, well, it seems like we're you, know what, you know what was left was really confusion. So, um, so just so everyone understands is GACP and, you know, just to, you know, to educate the investor base, um, GACP is when you go to GMP, you basically have a medical authority come and inspect you for five days, right? So you work with a consulting firm and then, then the medical authority comes and inspects the government comes and say it be at the German government or be it the Maltese government or whichever government um, you want to work with. Um, they'll come and they'll inspect you for five days and they'll certify you for certain GMP processes. Okay. Um, GACP works a little differently where effectively a consulting firm is going to tell us and designate us as GACP, but there is no, there's a governing body for GACP that gives you the GACP standards, but they're independent consulting firms with the exception of Holland, which has a quote unquote standard, but uh, you know, I, I'll leave it at that. 
um, that basically says that, look, we've audited your practices, we've audited everything, and you're certified to be GACP. Um, and we think that that certification will come latest within the next two weeks, conservatively, right? Okay. Um, but what does that mean, really? It really, honestly, you know, it means that from our perspective, we, we're running a tight ship. Um, but what it means is still any customer who comes down is still going to have to come down and inspect us, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing is that all it means is that we've had a consulting firm and an accreditation and now we have the designation, but still to sell product, the customer is going to have to come down and validate the processes if the GACP is an input into GMP. Okay. okay. Excellent. So that gives some clarity uh, to investors on how that process works. Right. Let's right. fly back over to America and let's talk about your recent strategic partnership with Elegance Brands. Uh, have you tasted right. any of the products Elegance has to offer? That's, so, of course. Now, this is this is funny. I was at an event in Vegas. Actually, Katie was with me and Chad and um, Elegance sponsored the event and he had um, they had their Voco and their Sway. So the Voco is the let me remember it's the vodka drink. And Sway is the sort of energy hard seltzer drink. And so the I've tasted both Voco and Sway. Katie, you've tasted them, obviously, because you're sitting on that board, right? Yes, I've tasted them. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're good products. Um, they're formulated well. Uh, so that's a good question. That's a fair question. Right. The, and then, and then, I see the next question is, what is the justification for saying beverage sales will be at a run rate of 1 million by year end? Okay, and that's yeah. our target. I have a bit of a, I'll just give some context to that. Um, on Twitter, you mentioned that, and uh, investors are wondering, since there's not much info available on Elegance's 2020 financials, um, how do you plan to achieve 1 million a month run rate by the so, year end? So you got to understand, all right, so this probably wasn't clear. So Elegance is in mainline distribution. So they have this Gorilla hemp product. They have um, they have their hard seltzer. They have their vodka. They have their um, vodka soda, you know, drink that's flavored. Mm -hmm. And that is in distribution. And they're in liquor distribution. I think they're the official drink of the Phoenix Suns and the San Diego Padres and someone popped, I don't I forgot who it was, Lee or one of the investors said that uh, um, they saw them as a sponsor of the US Open as well. So they're in the traditional liquor business. We probably are not going to use their brands in our THC channel, okay? So what they're providing us with is the technology and know-how, right, to be mm -hmm. able to do that. In return, we thought, and it was really Philip, who's not on this call, he had eye surgery just recently this week, that the share swap would be a good idea because they're going public on the NEO and the discount at which we got it to relative to where he thought the public offering would be and where the last sale price of the shares were to a bona fide third party investor. Um, was a good transaction to sort of put that asset on our books. But operationally, they have a complete turnkey unit, um, but it's aluminum can, and we're debating whether we go into glass bottles versus aluminum cans, which is just the end of the project. And that unit we're going to put down in California um, before the end of the year. It's a turnkey unit. They come up with the formulations. They've researched the market but they don't have the licensing. So we put that, we put the beverage unit in, and then at that point we begin to sell and distribute product, right? I don't know where the guys are at, because as I said, I've been in Europe, um, Katie could probably fill us in, and then with the million dollar run rate, Katie can back that up with BDS data. Okay, so a quick question, uh, just a, a follow up on, on elegance before we move on. From a cultural standpoint, how do you envision those beverages to be consumed? Would you be expected to drink uh, a single can in, a, in an evening or is it multiple cans? What kind of costs are we looking at for these products and profit margins? Okay, so Katie, um, Katie can talk to that more, talk, to, talk more to it. 
But from what I gather, the way the beverage market has gone is it's not like, let's say, um, the hush style, um, uh, the hush style uh, um, syrups that we make or the scissors that we make. Um, this is more of a light product, which is, say, 5 ml over a complete can, nano emulsified. So it's a seltzer that's 5 ml. So it's sort of sip and gives you a light feeling as opposed to a um, heavy feeling of the, you know, of the product. Um, but Katie, why don't you elaborate on that? Because it's a different demo um, than, let's say, the Hush demo. It's more of a Winberry demo. Well, I think a lot of it, too, depends on this, you know, the jurisdiction you're launching in and what the regulations are around per container uh, of milligrams of THC, but I know that in the way we're modeling it is, you know, one can uh, with the number of milligrams possible. And I don't, and I agree with what Kieran's saying, which is it's not, the goal is not to drink it. And in the same way, you know, for Cezurup, for example, there's a lot of THC there. It's not quite as much THC. And it's supposed to be more as more of a balanced effect, but California and Oregon have different regulations. So, um, you know, we can certainly, I think it would probably take a follow-up. We'd have to dip, uh, dive into the financial model um, that, you know, again, Philip and his team that did due diligence and helped put together the assessment and all of that, um, they could probably share that in some form uh, to help back up those, those projections. But yes, it's not really the same format as the same product experience as the Cezurup that we have. It's definitely more of a, you know, five, 10 milligram type thing per can. Um, and then maybe in Oregon, it, it allows for more potentially, but, but again, it's, we're not really going for that with the drinks. And, okay. um, and where's the, where's the BDS numbers at retail sales sort of currently, um, in California right now of these, what we call these light, um, these light, uh, you know, seltzers, so to speak, THC-based seltzers? Uh, the, BDS, the BDS data comes out every month. Uh, I don't know that we've published a product update recently, but it's pretty easy for us. And, you know, what I can even do is during this call, we can quickly look at the most recent newsletter that came out. And more or less, it shows that ingestibles, that's the area of the, the market, that that's a, that's a growing area. It's a growing product segment. So there's increasing now. Is it the largest? No, of course there's not as to, much demand for it as flour per se, but um, we can certainly, even within the context of this call, probably get a, you know, a sense of how large the segment is. Okay. Right. So, I so a, where where I where I came up with that is there's a company um, can right now that's out there that's growing um, pretty at a pretty substantial rate with just California distribution. And they're over a million, and they're they've been growing at a fair clip. I think they're ticker C A N N, but I'm not sure. And so where I came up with that number is saying that look, if we can come in there and match them, given you know Elegance's uh, um, formulations, you know their flavoring and all of that, that if the market keeps growing, that we could probably achieve their one million number if we can get this unit up by September or October in California. So that's how I came right. up with the number one million. Okay. And Katie can tell you where they're at right now. But I think the category is 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 probably this sort of light seltzer category is is growing at a really fast clip. That's why we went for it. Okay. And we yeah, the year, I know the year over year growth was one hundred ten percent. Right. Uh, so it's a it's, it's it's a big clip. Substantial. Um, let's talk about Oregon and California sales. Um, with Philip stating 50 million from current operations, uh, 22 million from dispensary sales, and an additional 3 million out of a fellow, which we now know is a little bit less. Are there any right. changes to these revenue expectations given what you know now? Um, I'll tell you what, I'm, what we're looking at. I'm just looking at the numbers. So what we're, where we're at right now is roughly in wholesale sales to dispensaries, we're at about Roughly around, give or take a hundred thousand, around four, you know, million is where we're at today, right? Um, what we're projecting in uh, September is to be at about is to grow that business 
just our core business right now to about 4.5 to 4.6 million. Um, but that doesn't include flower shop, anything to do with elegance, anything to do with the rosin business that we've developed and other licensing deals we're doing right now. So we're in the middle of a bunch of other licensing deals and launching the Winberry products in California. So when you start taking all of that and putting it into place, you know, the way I would look at it is that in the core business by September, we should be at 6 million. Now we'll talk about the dispensaries later, but Katie's looking at kicking one off every month. And she was thinking that she would get the first one done by July, which is now tracked to August. So if she gets the first one down by August and let's say each of those dispensaries conservatively bring in, let's say a million to a million and a half a month, then you're now you're starting to see about, let's say not say one, say, say one and a half, say three, three on six is nine. So now where do you find another 2 million is the question. And mm -hmm. there you have a little bit from coming in from Buffalo. You have a little bit um, coming in from the Kush Bar retail stores. They're about 300,000. So you can see 10. And now the question is, where do you find the other million? 1 million. But yeah, I would say 10 to 11 is, is definitely attainable. Um, um, we have, we are a month behind on the dispensary launches. Um, so yeah, I would say that I'd say 10 to 12 by September, October, definitely. And, you know, Katie, as we've said, is physically moved to California. We brought Ryan Kunkel on who, you know, is a dominant operator in, uh, in Washington as our vice chairman, uh, who, who's brought his team, a lot of his team members aboard. Um, that, you know, they've built great dispensaries up in Washington. If you guys have not been to um, his, uh, any of his dispensaries up there, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're very, very good. And they're the uh, basis now of, uh, I believe, High Times dispensaries in California. So, yeah, I, I definitely see that range of 10 to 12 being attainable. Um, and a lot of it's driven by the dispensaries and getting the dispensaries up. Great. And based on your projections, which month do you expect to reach profitability if those revenue numbers stay on track? Um, that's a, you know, that's a complicated question in the sense that what we expect is um, the operating, we expect that all of our units will be contributing operating profit before public company costs um, within by that September timeframe, September, October timeframe. The issue is gonna be how do those public company costs carve up as effectively now you're, you know, you have right now a conda coming online, you have Halo Tech coming online. And so that's something we're gonna to have to revisit. Um, but to the core Halo business where all the revenue is being driven, um, a conda and Halo Tech, if anything, what they do is they relieve public company operating costs to a certain extent, right? Um, because right now, for instance, we're carrying um, substantial costs for a conda um, where their business model is very different, meaning that where, you know, personally, I see, I see a lot more upside in the medical markets abroad now that I've been here than I see in the U.S. markets. Mm -hmm. um, and but I see a longer time horizon with Halo Tech. Um, I see that being a shorter time horizon, but a completely different business um, mindset. And I think Philip was looking at maybe a, I think two or three cents a share is what he was looking at analytically when we looked at that. So um, so that's really a tricky question. But if you combine everything and you have it all together. Philip sees profitability altogether by November, December timeframe, but it could accelerate depending on you know, what we strategically do with certain assets over the next uh, six months. Uh, let's, uh, let's just quickly talk about that uh, with, um, with the Halo Tech spinoff. Has a record date been determined and how much will Halo Collective reduce in SG&A costs when Halo Tech spins off? So, so Philip actually has been working on it. A record date has not, I don't believe, been determined yet. Uh, 
there's certain, how do I say it? I think the way Philip is looking at that business is he's looking at, he's looking at potential combinations with other businesses. Um, so I don't think there's going to be a lot of S G and a relief there. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of upside potential. And the other thing that's interesting there is none of the businesses that Philip is looking at currently are, um, 280 E taxable. So like hypothetically, say he's looking at a, a novel cart business. Hypothetically, he may be looking at, and this is purely hypothetically, let's say testing businesses or other businesses um, that are smaller that can be that platform. Um, but he does have his steps memo now. He does have his audits all being done. Um, and I, I, you know, honestly, I can't tell you what his target is. But if I was to sort of put a guess on it, I would say end of Q3, early Q4. Um, and are you still on track to reach that 11 million a month in revenue by September this year? We're, we're running down to six months left in a guidance. Of that, that's, what, that's, what I just, that's what I just went over with you in detail, right? Cause mm -hmm. I built it up the waterfall, right? So okay. if you get 6 million from, if you get 6 million from your, from the core business, which is the recreational, um, sales of cannabis products and related products to dispensaries. You can get, you get 6 million from that. You get another 3 million from the dispensaries themselves that we're putting up. Mm -hmm. They're at very good locations. Then you got to find another 2 million, right? So Buffalo, as I said, maybe let's say we can do three to, let's say two to 500,000. You have 300,000 a month coming from push bar, right? So somewhere between between that 10 to $12 million range you'd be at, depending on how big of a hit the dispensaries are. I mean, the dispensaries are really, really, really critical, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is yep. a critical cog in the Halo recreational North American business. Let's have a, there's a question about the California dispensaries. How far along in the licensing process is Halo for the dispensaries in LA? Um, Katie, you can answer this because you live this every day. Yes, absolutely. So the short answer is that each dispensary is kind of its own unique, uh, it's its own unique can of worms. Um, but starting with the one that is most likely to open, that we believe will be open this summer, we plan for it to be open this summer, um, that is the Westwood location. Um, we will be closing on the transaction of, of acquiring that license as soon as the DCR approves the ownership change, which again, it's just a regulatory process. We're not really allowing it to hold it up uh, because we've actually have a, a rendering for it, a very thorough rendering of every you know view inside, outside. Um, we've already been developing uh, the materials, the security plans, the actual architectural plans, and our goal is to in the next week pull permits, uh, bid out the project and start construction in July. So it's really, that will be in a parallel path to all of the regulatory steps that need to be taken. And so just to kind of recap that are gonna be, uh, there's no site change required because it's the site that was approved with the original application. There's going to be an ownership transfer and then uh, temporary approval at the local level that then leads to state license. We actually can submit both at the same time. We can apply for a state license. Um, and then once the state license is awarded, uh, we can apply for the local license to open. Excellent. So again, those are just kind of a stepwise process there. Now, the uh, Lankersham site, that's the North Hollywood site that we've been working on for some time now. We actually are, are already have closed the transaction because we have the ownership uh, was was passed some time ago that we're uh, the, the majority owners of that. Um, the issue there is that we're still locking down that site. Um, and actually, we are, you know, Know, essentially locked it down, but the DCR is still going through its process to approve the site change. That's something that, again, it's, um, I actually was at an event the other day with an industry event in town and um, had the chance to hear the uh, one of the, the managers over at DCR talk a little bit about what they're going through, but they've lamented the fact that they've just been short-staffed. They're actually closed on Fridays. So to process all of the 
applications, paperwork, ownership, site, and think about the number of social equity applicants that you know were awarded licenses. It's just a tremendous amount of paperwork, um, but but we keep pushing through. We're in touch with the uh, light of the, the licensing. They call them basically the licensing analysts that work on each of the uh, issuing each of the licenses and all the approvals associated with it. And so that one, again, we think that's a matter of time before. Uh, and really for the Franklin site too, that, that's the West Hollywood site, same thing there. Uh, we are getting official approval of the site change. And then we've already applied for the, you know, we've already applied for the ownership transfer as well there. So they're all kind of in a similar, those, sec those last two are in a similar holding pattern. But um, like I said, with that first site that we do expect to get open this summer, as soon as the plans and we pull the permits and the rendering has the finishing touches and the general contractor is going to work, we're going to quickly shift over the design team, which includes the architect, uh, designer, you know, everyone, basically it's a working group of about four people at the moment, and they're going to shift over and start designing those other two sites. So they're in the pipeline and it's just going to be, you know, we just want to have it on rinse and repeat here and get all three open, hopefully by the end of the year, you know, I mean, that's really the goal. And I think, um, but the, we definitely have our line of sight on that first one. It'll be open, we expect, by August. That's so exciting. So, so the critical thing there to understand is with Ryan, Ryan and now Robin and Steven and the people he's bringing in, you, you know, with Have a Heart and Mr. Gr you know, Mr. Greens and all the stores he's put up, um, you know, including the high time souls stores that I'm sure a lot of you know the history where Ryan sold Have a Heart outside of Washington um, to Harvest and then Harvest subsequently sold it to High Times. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have a team that's done this many times before, down to the milling of the cabinets, down to what layouts work. This is not something we have to reinvent. I mean, we have you know, I would say arguably one of the best West Coast dispensary operators in Ryan, um, you know, as, you know, as the person leading this charge with Katie, and he's brought all his resources to bear. Um, so, you know, that is, um, you know, so I'm, I'm very comfortable, you know, again, I give Katie lofty goals, but I'm telling Katie, look, I want one up and running by August, I want one up and running by September, and I want the other one up and running by October. Um, and they're all killer locations, especially um, the Westwood one, which is the first one. If you guys know L.A. well, you know where the Mormon Temple is on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard. You know where the McDonald's is on Santa Monica and Westwood. That intersection, how busy it is. It's smack right there. You know, it is, it is, it is triple A plus location. Um, and the Excellent. other two are really killer locations as well. And I think patience is a virtue um, here, right? You know, because retail is about location and bringing Ryan on and, you know, being a little patient here, you know, as opposed to what I call a little um, short-term pain for long-term gain is really where we've been at with these dispensaries. But it's really our focus. When I leave, um, when I leave uh, Africa um, in the next six days, I'm, you know, going to, you know, kiss my uh, kiss my kids um, up in Seattle and head down to LA. Ryan's been spending a lot of time down there, um, and it's a big focus. Um, and then we become we start forming that seed to sale sort of locust in California, which is really critical to be able to compete with the bigger guys. Great. Have you been able to identify opportunities to expand or build retail dispensary stores in uh, Southern California and in the Bay Area? So Ryan has, so the the concept there, and Katie can talk about it more, is clusters. But, I mean, Ryan, being who he is, has been really active in bringing deals forward. And uh, just to be quite frank, um, we're not the only game in town looking for these sorts of deals, right? And so there are larger MSOs looking for these sorts of deals. So we have to be a little bit more nimbler um, than them and a little bit more aggressive than them in order to tie some of these up. I think we have two right now, Katie, that we're talking with, right? We've, you know, we've lost beauty shows on a couple of them. And, uh, 
you know, the other thing we're looking for right now, if anyone knows of it, because I see there are a lot of people online, is we're looking for pre-ICO licenses in LA. <laughs> so um, that way we can form a cluster. But what Ryan is saying, and I think he's absolutely right, he's saying, Karen, look, you, you don't want to have five stores in Southern California and one store up in Mount Shasta. That just makes no sense. So mm -hmm. if you're going to go into the Bay Area, we go in with a cluster. If we go into now we have three in L.A., let's see if we can build out more. We have a limitation, so we need to do pre-ICO. Katie, anything to add? No, I, I think that's exactly right. That's the overarching strategy, and we're in discussions with two groups now that have, uh, you know, a couple, more than a couple uh, dispensaries whether they be licenses or in various stages of operation and are discussing with them uh, what a potential deal would look like. And, I, and our intention is to move forward with at least one of them. But of course, the team has to do a lot of due diligence. Um, but we, you know, we try to work on creative arrangements, too, where we can even keep keep on some of the acquisition team to do things like earn outs to make sure that you know, the actual performance doesn't fall solely upon our shoulders. So we try to work on creative uh, solutions to uh, get to an answer. And again, we still, uh, you know, we, we, this is a, this is an extremely important part of our strategy. And, you know, we would like to have as many dispensaries as we can, um, especially building up a critical mass of a cluster in Southern California. And, you know, at that point, then thinking about expanding uh, to other key markets in the state. Let's, um, let's talk about how these stores would potentially be supplied. Um, the California Cultivation, has Triangle received its licenses and can we expect uh, build outs to commence and sales for November this year? Katie, Katie's running, Katie's running point on Triangle. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, what I'm seeing um, at Buffalo, interestingly, and, and with Anthony coming on, Lacombe coming on, is I'm seeing a lot of parallels between Buffalo and and Bar X or Triangle, meaning you know we're taking from Jed his um, and Green Matter, which is a monster grower, right? Keep in mind Jed and Joe still own like I think up to twenty percent of Connected or fifteen to twenty percent. I mean these guys are monster growers, so we've taken some of their best practices and we're putting it under shade cloth here in Buffalo. And, and Anthony really is being sent up to Bar X and Triangle to get those, you know, 20 acres, 20 acres of greenhouses spec'd out. And that's what we look at as a phase two here at Buffalo, right, is getting 20 acres up. Obviously, that's going to take a year to two years, no matter where you put them up. Um, and, you know, you're looking at just in power alone, you're looking at 500 KDA, you know. So when you look at all of that, um, there are a lot of parallels um, that we're seeing definitely between Africa um, and Triangle. Um, so that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Katie, and Katie can tell you exactly where the licensing stands because she's on it day to day. Sure, sure, no problem. Uh, so essentially, the county staff recommended approval of an early activation permit on June 20th. Uh, that is the permit that we need to proceed to operations. Uh, you know, in a parallel path, we've been applying and receiving state licenses, but there is a seven day waiting period for neighbors to appeal the county's decision to grant the activation permit, early activation permit. So that of course will end very soon. You know, all indications point to receiving the early activation permit. So hopefully at the beginning of next week, we will we will have even more uh, exciting news to update everyone on that. That's really and exciting. What, Katie, what about the state level? Um, to explain to them how crazy it's been at the state level. Well, we've just, you know, the state, the way the state licenses work is, you know, there's one per X thousand feet of canopy and obviously on 60 acres, 80, 70, 80 acres of grow, you're going to have hundreds, hundreds of licenses. And so we've applied, you know, obviously we applied for all of them and they've been granting them in uh, in tranches. I don't know what the running total is right now. Um, you know, we maybe have, we're 50% of the way there, but every day uh, we get a couple more. And so we, you know, we definitely think that 
at the same time that we're getting the early activation permit, more of the state licenses will come in. And, and when all is said and done, we're going to be able to, you know, the state license won't be, the state licensing won't be a bottleneck. Um, they'll just kind of continue to trickle in uh, as we get up to speed with the early activation. Great. That gives a good insight to folks curious about how that's uh, playing out. Um, let's talk about Canadian operations. Uh, when will Halo close on the Krishpar dispensaries? And you mentioned they're generating about 300000 a month. Um, yeah, when are we looking yep. at closing those? Yep, they're going to close on July 1st. <clears throat> so we, uh, just before this call, I synced with our contact over there. Uh, he and I have been working on the closing items together along with some of our other team members which has really run the gamut. It's been very, very fun. Uh, it's been great to integrate and meet some of the team members there. And anyway, long story short, we have a couple more lease assignments to execute on our side. And then all is ready to go. We've been doing trial payrolls with the company we set up. Um, we do have them doing a management agreement for about a year. So it takes a little bit of the uh, you know, pressure off of us to have all of our ducks in a row. And they've been great partners so far, but all of the systems are in place, the inventory counts, all of that, all of it's taking place and all of it's set to close July 1st. That's excellent. I think that's some of the most exciting news folks were waiting for. So, so what's going to be interesting there is, as opposed to doing things the way we've done them in the past, where we go, let's say, from cultivation or manufacturing down through dispensaries, in Canada, our approach is going to be tactically the opposite. It's going to be more like a PE firm. Right, so we're looking at a bunch of sort of little clusters of retail um, like this that are profitable that we can LBO, where we don't have to use equity per se, but we can LBO. Here on this one, as you guys know, um, uh, Raj and company at High Tide are basically financing them. And so, what'll be critical then is to get our products listed, and this is where Tej kicks in again, and. To, in my mind, and we're still sort of debating it, is that really the Canadian business really belongs with a condo more than it belongs with Halo because, you know, Canada is part of that whole INCB, that whole, you know, a lot of Canadians are exporting a hell of a lot of product to Europe, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, Canada is part of like that global cannabis economy that America just is not part of. So it probably fits more in with Tej, and that's the business him. And we just brought Dallas on from, I think it was Terrasend. Um, you know, so we brought people on to start looking at that business. And again, it's the same sort of concept in Canada um, that we have in Africa, where you take, you know, trusted California brands, and you start bringing them, and you start bringing novel products that aren't, you know, that aren't in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we win and, you know, sometimes we've lost. I mean, with dab taps, it turned out to be like a flop in, uh, in the Western United States, but it could turn out to be the, the golden ticket in the UK with, <laughs> with the NHS, yeah. with, with dosability, right? So you never know. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that uh, the Krish Bar dispensaries are essentially financed. Um, do they have enough cash right now? Um, so... Do they have enough cash? The way the deal works, and again, you guys can look on CDAR, I'm sure it's all filed there, is that we have to buy the initial inventory, right? But they manage it for us. And if it operates at a deficit, they fund the deficit to a certain degree. Isn't that the way it works, Katie? Help me if I'm saying it right. If I'm not, please correct me. Sorry, we went on mute there for a second, guys. Um, no, I think that that's, def that's definitely the gist of it. So, uh, again, I mean, not to get too far down in the weeds here, but we can look up the particulars of the accounting. But the uh, the intention is for it to be profitable, and they are already profit profitable, the stores, after the expenses. Great. So, Great. I'm going to take this back to uh, Tej. Uh, this is a question regarding... Um, the possible Aconda spinoff. Has there been any progress made in your strategic planning regarding Aconda being listed on the LSE or NASDAQ? 
Yeah, so it's a great question. We're exploring all strategic options right now. And so, you know, for many reasons, we, we can't comment exactly on things like spin outs and uh, you know, keep keeping in mind uh, the, the strict rules of the uh, financial regulators that, that govern us. But um, what we can say is that uh, the assets fit neatly together in a package. Uh, we've done all of our, our, our audits the right way. And uh, you know, it's these types of things that, that set you up to becoming an independent company. So, so we're, we're, we're going to do what's right for the shareholders and what creates the most value. And, uh, and it's going to be creating a business that generates great returns and, uh, and creates that value. Excellent. That's a great response. Um, I have a question regarding uh, Malta. What's happening with the letter of intent? for purchasing MedCan, and how does that impact the $30 million offtake agreement that was signed? Okay, so with MedCan and Malta, um, how do I say this in a tactful way? Um, Tasia's Rolodex is a lot deeper, um, you know, heading up BMO in, in Europe um, and working at Canopy and Chiron and building out the businesses. So Tej has his own vision of how he wants to go about entering the market. Malta may be part of it, um, but he, he has his own vision. And so that is the plan. How do I say it? The plan with Tej is becoming a lot more sophisticated because quite frankly, the medical business, what I've learned over the last three weeks um, and taking a crash course from Tej is very, very different and very, very, very different from the recreational business. So what I have to tell you is that, um, is that I think the issue for Tej is going to be how much we're going to be able to grow. <laughs> Actually, Tej, what's your, what's your vision for a condo? Yeah. So, um, look, I, I think there's many ways to get your product to market and, uh, what, what's happening is is uh, is now that the European market is starting to develop. You're starting to see parts of the value chain uh, develop into niches, just like you would any other type of market. So you've got your distributors, your sales and marketing firms, um, your your growers, and you don't necessarily need to tie it all up at once, um, unless that's the right thing to do. Right? If there is a return map that makes sense, then you do that. But uh, like I spent the last uh, almost two years building a, a business which was uh, asset light uh, I was able to do brand licensing agreements and and really you know, kind of be sort of like a coca-cola like on the formulations and uh, outsource distribution and and manufacturing now I'm coming at this from a really unique supply asset and so you know I can say that uh, oh, just over the past week I've had uh, half a dozen important distribution partners reach out and it's really now just figuring out which is the best, what makes sense for our product set, who's going to position our product the best, or or do we do a mix of, uh, you know, sort of build versus partner. So so I'm running all of those calculations now. Uh, well, well, you know, sort of getting uh, feet under the table, meeting the people, meeting, you know, really understanding the assets, right? I mean, uh, it, it's hard to make deals when when you don't, uh, you know, really touch and feel everything, and and, and that's what we've been doing. I mean, we're here literally touching, feeling, tasting, <laughs> that's the way to doing do it, it right? all. But I mean, that's, no, that's the way you have to do it. I mean, we, I mean, Chad, we brought our, I mean, we brought Chad with us who just stepped in from the airport, you know, um, himself. And, and I mean, we're, we're going through bags, we're sniffing bags, we're grinding it up, we're smoking it, you know, we're, we're, we're in it, you know, literally in the conference room, just, you know, working, working it the way we used to work it. And, and Andreas and I have always had a, you know, and Philip as founders of all that has a philosophy is whatever you grow, you're going to sell and you're going to sell at good margin, you know, and the key is to just grow it and grow it in growing it for Europe requires a little bit more stability, it requires a little bit more testing, requires a little bit more of everything because it's pharmaceutical and Tej brings that and he brings that distribution. I think, That's it, exciting. I think when I, the best analogy I could is when you see those plants growing out in the field, you know, think think like you're growing like Advil's <laughs> right? in a way, right? When you think about bringing it to the market the same medicine. way, medicine. Yeah, it's medicine. It's it's a it's having a certain amount of shelf life. It's having 
a, a consistent uh, API content, so the active pharmaceutical ingredients, THC and CBD, that fall within a, a fairly narrow range. So uh, in some ways, it's, it's a good thing for, the, for the, the patient at the end of the day, right? I mean, if you're expecting a certain outcome, uh, you're going to get it by following all these strict regulations. And then, uh, you know, when you have pharma grade uh, regulations, which in, ensure that you're getting uh, safety checks, uh, uh, all the sort of clean room stuff to make sure contaminants are extremely low. I mean, you, you know you're getting a much better product, a much better experience than you would say the black market alternative. And, and we're still way early days in Europe. I mean, the mm -hmm. German market, 250 million euros last year, but the, the market the cent is probably 10 times that. Uh, if you look at just, just putting it on the same types of numbers as say Canada or, or states in the US. Gorilla mm -hmm. Glue is the number one seller in Germany, by the way. Number one in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to chime in there quickly. I mean, to me, it, it's it's in it is definitely the way you're saying, Tej, in, in Europe. But even in the U.S., it's you know the data is out there. Legal consumption through legal channels is nowhere near where it can be once there's federal legalization. So, for each sector of our business, there's just tremendous growth on the horizon. Um, you know, as long as regulations kind of continue to keep pace and make improvements. But um, the reality is all of legal consumption flooding into all of consumption flooding into legal channels is just like a landslide effect for every facet of our business. Great. Uh, I have a couple questions left before we're uh, down to our ending thoughts. Uh, question, uh, just a quick question from our group here. Can we get some clarity on is Kushbar going to be a part of the Aconda basket, or is that still up in the air? It's up in the air. Okay. It's up in the air, right. Okay. Let's move to um, operating efficiency. I hope, I hope it's part of the Aconda basket, because I really want to zero in on Oregon and California and let him. He's, <laughs> he's the Canadian citizen. He's the dual citizen, not me. So I'd rather put it in his basket than mine. You know, but it's fine. I like going up to Canada as well. But yeah. it is what it is, yeah. Uh, let's just talk about uh, operating efficiencies. You mentioned earlier you're bringing in in-house counsel and security. How much will the right. company be able to reduce in, in costs bringing those in-house for the upcoming quarters? Well, in Q2, you're going to probably see a pop in cost, but by Q3, you'll start to bring it down. So we brought, we brought three key functions in-house. We bought regulatory with Robin Francisco that Ryan brought in, and she's dynamite. Um, I mean, she, she did it for have a heart um, and, you know, for the longest of times and is an independent consultant. We brought in Stephen Round um, to reduce our security um, and our, um, uh, and our sa and safety costs. And uh, he's already, how do, I, how do I say it? He's already paid for himself for a year in some of the stuff he's found, um, which surprised us. Uh, but now we're bringing security in-house. We're bringing safety more in-house. Um, and then the third area is we brought Julie, who was, I think, the number two general counsel at Yahoo, or number three, um, really seasoned um, as our general counsel, who's trying to get all of that sort of under control. Um, as we grow now, with the exceptions of, you know, Tasia's business is different, but um, with the exception of the business that I focus on, um, you know, besides right now, Oregon cultivation and uh, California retail, um, you know, I think those are the two areas on our plates. And right now, um, are, are we going to go buy a license in New York? No. Are we going to go buy a license in Virginia? So I think you're going to start to see a lot of those costs that we've had to expense with the acquisitions we've made. I think we're both, I think we have all the products we need. We, we cover all the major product lines, you know, um, we cover, you know, we're covering seed to sale. So really what you're really going to see now is if anything, we're pulling the trigger on more Oregon cultivation and we're pulling the trigger on, um, uh, on more California retail. Right. Internationally, I can't really speak for Tej because he's just starting to formulate his strategy. So you will start seeing that SG&A um, as a percentage of sales come down. And so what I preach to everyone on the U.S. side of the business is 
there, there are three things that have to happen. Your, um, your revenues have to go up, your gross margin has to improve, and your SGNA as a percentage of sales has to decrease, right? And that, that we, that's a metric we look at, not month by month, but week by week almost. Okay, I'm getting the, uh, the, the signal from Cody here for my last question from uh, sure. the collective batch here. Uh, this is going to be about the stock price development. There has been consistent sell-off in sizes of two to four million shares at a time. And as you can publicly see, there is frustration from some investors when continually acquiring companies via shares. Is Halo at a tipping point with equity-based acquisitions? Um, so what, what we want to do now is use the entire balance sheet to the extent we can. So be it, you know, I think we already have um, a facility in place with LeafLink, which is something we've never done before. Um, we have that working capital facility in place, which we pulled only once in a while. But what we're trying to do now is like, say for, for instance, hypothetically, we buy um, a large indoor grow. Uh, and what we're going to try to do is finance the improvement or the construction of that growth through debt. As long as we can get debt below our average cost of capital, which I think Philip thinks is about 16% or thereabouts, we're going to try to use more debt. I think we've grown up now where we can actually start to use some debt. And has the ATM been used at all during this? Um, what you'll find out if and when we've used the ATM during the second quarter report, because it'll be in our second quarter report. Excellent. I believe that wraps up all the questions from the community that we funneled into this nice tight list for you. Uh, Katie, Tej, um, Kieran, Cody, Beth, thank you so much for carving this time out for us and, and putting us together and answering some concerns that the investors have I believe you answered them well and to your fullest capability. And we look forward to the news flow that's going to be coming out. All right. Well, hey, thanks for uh, having us. And uh, we apologize for our rough, but we've all been, we've all been on the go today. We can, right. we can understand. All right. Thank Take you care. so much. Take care. Okay, Bye, guys. Bye. Recording.